Okay, I think we can go ahead and get started so that we stay on track today. Um, first and foremost, welcome and congratulations once again on your offer of admission to the University at Buffalo School of Law. We are happy that you joined us this afternoon as we kick off our virtual Admitted Students Week. My name is Lindsay Gladney. I'm your Vice Dean for Admissions, and I commend each of you for considering New York's public law school for your legal education. The Office of Admissions put together a series of virtual events and resources to give you a comprehensive post-admission experience and hope you will take advantage of them throughout the week. And by now, you should have also received an invitation for an on-campus visit. Um, so we are very, very excited that we can welcome visitors back to campus this spring. Campus visits will take place throughout the month of April. They begin next week, April 11th, and they'll run through Thursday, April 28th. So we encourage you to take advantage of this option as well. If you haven't already signed up for one, I believe you received um, an email last week and a reminder email earlier today. You are welcome to visit campus, uh, meet one-on-one -on -one with someone from the admissions office here at the law school, attend a first year law lecture and tour the law library with our incredible law librarians. Um, I strongly again, encourage you to schedule an in-person visit so you can get a real firsthand experience of what it's like here at the law school. This week, you will also, of course, have the opportunity to hear from current students, faculty, staff, and alumni, and discover a welcoming and supportive environment paired with a practice-ready curriculum and access to rewarding careers. So today, as you know, I'm joined by our Dean, Aviva Abramovsky, who will promote, sorry, who will provide welcome remarks, and then we'll open the floor to questions. Aviva Abramovsky is the law school's 19th permanent dean and the first woman to hold the position. She is an expert in insurance law, commercial law, regulation of financial entities, and legal ethics, and she is the former chair of the New York State Bar Association's Task Force on Autonomous Vehicles and the Law. Since her arrival in June of 2017, Dean Abramowski has established the law school as a hub for legal education at all levels. In addition to the traditional JD program, four LLM programs, and a two-year degree for internationally trained attorneys, the law school now offers an undergraduate program in law, one of just two in the nation, and a new doctor of juridical science. Without further ado, please welcome Dean Aviva Abramowski. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. Thank you um, to everyone here, and congratulations on being admitted. That is a big deal, right? Round of applause for yourselves. Obviously, thank you to Vice Dean Gladney and the whole admissions crew for making this day possible for you and us. And I am very excited to see you. So obviously we prefer to see you in person, but many of you from out of town. So it's good also to have this as an option um, for, for us to get to know each other a little bit. So I'm so grateful for all of you to be here. And first really congratulate yourselves on being admitted. That is a big deal. Um, you've got, uh, admissions also has a great line of other events. So I hope you take advantage of them. To, those include, for example, two of our law professors, Samantha Barbas and Rebecca French, are going to be opening up their classrooms to you this week. So if you'd like to see what a typical first year class is like or find out what a tour is, which is definitely not what it sounds like, this is your opportunity. Be sure to join them. Um, we are now, I always think a tour sounds like a cake, but you'll find out it's actually got a lot to do with law. We are now offering also in-person tours of our building. If you haven't had a chance to walk the halls of O'Brien to get a sense of what your new home would feel like, please feel free to reach out to admissions and schedule it. We'd love to see you here. All right, this is a very exciting time. Each of you are at the threshold of a challenging but incredibly fulfilling journey. I want to again congratulate you all on making the decision to pursue legal education at this critical time. When understanding the importance of the rule of law and working to preserve it and protect it has never been more important. We're facing a number of social issues that require thoughtful and passionate advocacy. Armed with a law degree and the skills you'll learn here in law school, you'll be prepared to take them on. That may seem like a lofty goal right now, but we know that every single one of you has what it takes. You have the grades, you have the passion, you have the work ethic, we would not have admitted you to our law school if we did not believe you are ready. So now that you've made the decision to go to law school, I'd like to remind you why UB Law School is the right place for you. Um, it's fair to say that over the past two years of the pandemic, we've all struggled from time to times with feelings of isolation. 
Let me assure you that as a member of the UB Law community, you will never be alone. Our faculty and staff are committed to your education and to your well being. We offer a wide variety of support services to help you adapt to law school and make sure that you stay on the path. We've got, for example, peer to peer advocate programs, which is a wonderful group of people for you to work with. That will provide you with access to a network of second and third year students who can help you navigate your first year of law school and answer your questions. We also have a low faculty to student ratio, which means you'll get far more personalized attention here than at many other law schools. And you'll be assigned a faculty advisor who will meet with you one-to-one -one throughout the first year to help acclimate you to the study of law. Many of those advisors go on to be lifetime mentors and friends. We also offer a number of student wellness initiatives to provide you with support outside of the classroom. We are, for example, in the middle of our 12 weeks of wellness this semester. Each week, our student affairs office organizes a wide variety of programs, including things like guided meditation, financial advising, and book exchanges. And we have a fantastic, absolutely fantastic alumni, alumni network of more than 13,000 graduates who will be a part of your educational experience from day one. We have an especially strong presence in the Western New York area. More than 85% of all of the attorneys in Erie County are alumni of this law school. Our alumni are partners in the legal education of our students. They teach classes, they'll be your mentors, they supervise externships, they help our new graduates find jobs. Your connection to the bench and bar begins on your very first day of law school and will continue throughout the whole course of your career. They're truly exceptional people. And as you'll see over the course of this week and going forward, they are very excited to meet you. And if I know anything about Buffalo, you know that we are all connected by an inherent and sometimes unexplainable love for sports. Off court, we combine our passion for sports and our passion for the law. We offer a concentration in sports law and our growing center for the advancement of sports host discussion groups with prominent professionals from the sports industry. This spring alone, they've hosted, for example, Ken Belson, the NFL correspondent for the New York Times, Daniel Milstein, an a NHL super agent, panel of powerful women in sports, including Lisa Friedel, um, senior VP for investigations at the NFL, and Tara Vanderveer, coach of Stanford University's women's basketball team. We include this so that you have an idea of some of the enrichment opportunities available for you over the course of the year. And we are just as passionate, actually more so, about our commitment to social justice. It is the heart of the mission as our state of New York's law school. Our students are at the forefront using their legal skills to address some of our most pressing societal needs. Student attorneys at our new community engagement clinic, for example, are addressing the legal impact of the pandemic. They're helping clients by forestalling evictions, writing wills, assessing COVID impacts on prisoners, and appearing at unemployment hearings. These are opportunities that are available to all of you. Another thing student attorneys do, for example, is work in our criminal justice advocacy clinic. They are working on resentencing, resentencing cases under New York's new Domestic Violence Survivors Act. They have nine active cases and that continues to grow. It's important and meaningful work. And our civil rights and transparency clinic is addressing housing segregation issues in Erie County and just received funding to support work on gender equity and discrimination. As a student at the state of New York's law school, you will be part of a collective effort to see justice done. You'll have multiple opportunities to experience justice in action and to understand its power. And once you graduate from our law school, you will carry that experience with you regardless of what you choose to do or where you choose to practice. Our graduates go on to have amazing careers and lives and be extraordinary people. They hold powerful positions, not just in Western New York, but in many cities, including New York, DC, Boston, San Diego, Tokyo, Beijing, they are leaders in the law, in business, and in government, and in society. You'll find that a law degree will open up many paths for you, but it will be your UB Law community that guides you along the way. We will be there with you every step. This is a great place to be. I love it here, and it's a great community to be a part of. I congratulate each of you on all the hard work and dedication that has brought you here today, and I look forward to seeing you, hopefully soon, on campus. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dean Abramovsky. At this time, the floor is open to questions. So we wanted to leave you with as much time as possible to ask Dean Abramovsky some questions. 
You may use the chat box if you wish, wish, but we much prefer that you unmute and turn your video on so that we can see your lovely faces. So just keep in mind that this session is being recorded. Um, and in the event you are feeling shy, I have some questions prepared in advance, but we prefer to hear directly from you. Um, so at this time, the floor is open. Um, I guess I'll go first. Uh, thank you, Dean. Um, so you mentioned that your special your specialty was commercial law and um, insurance law, and I was wondering, are there any cl any clinics other than the U Law Center that focus on corporate and business law? Um, one of my interests is tax law. The other is bankruptcy and restructuring, and I know some of the other schools uh, have those types of clinics that are. There are there any opportunities to get involved with those as students at UB? Sure. So as you mentioned, and the other people might not know what the ELAW Center is. So let me talk just a little bit about it first. We have um, basically an entrepreneurial law center, which does um, venture capital and represents a variety of clients from conception out to business. Um, that's very, very popular and taught by our incredibly great professor, Matthew Pelkey, who um, work with, and I recommend you look into. There are other aspects in different clinics that touch upon business law, such as the Community Engagement and Development Clinic. Um, as we continue to go through iterations of post-pandemic work, um, those aspects of community development also come up through that clinic. So we don't currently have a specific clinic on tax law, but there are also opportunities through externships and pro bono work um, that you can get those types of work. And what we do have is the New York City Law and Finance Program which is a full semester immersive program um, that is also a lot of fun. You, I call it study abroad in New York City. Um, you go down to New York City for the semester, take advanced classes um, on corporate law and business law, taught by a lot of our alumni, and at the same time engage in an externship, usually for a business or other type of financial firm. Okay, thank you. And you could apply now for being pre-approved to reserve a space in that because it's a it's a very small uh, elite program. I, I just moved back to Buffalo from New York City, so I uh, I really don't have any intentions to go back anytime soon. <laughs> but okay, I, well that's fine. I appreciate that there's the that there's the uh, opportunity to do so. Great, Michael. I see your hand is up. Yeah. Good afternoon, uh, Dean Abramovsky and Vice Dean Gladney. Uh, thank you for taking the time to speak with us. So my question is, what steps, if any, has UB Law taken or plans to take with regards to accommodating those who are interested in labor law and labor issues? Are there opportunities or faculty within this field at UB Law or any plans to incorporate that in the future? Yes, so Professor Matthew Dimmick, who's on the faculty, um, is a national and international expert on labor and employment relations. Um, so I highly recommend you meet, um, if you're interested, we can put you in contact with Professor Jimmick. He does a lot of really great work directly in the field. Um, and in other, we also offer a variety of different opportunities and classes and things like employment discrimination, um, uh, ERISA, different types of pensions and benefits, a lot of things in those areas. But I'd recommend first maybe talk with Professor Jimmick since it is his life's passion. I really appreciate the opportunity to be put in touch with him. Thank you very much. You're welcome. There are many other faculty who also have overlapping interests, but we'll start there. Thank you. You got it. These are very specific questions. Anyone have something more general? Um, yeah, I, I can ask another one. Uh, what are some of the social events that the school puts on throughout the year for us to kind of get to know both our classmates as well as the classes above and below us? Sure. It seems like there are a lot of them. Um, so I would say that the majority of purely social events are run through the Student Bar Association, which are, have elected representatives from each class, and they do a variety of kind of socials and mixtures and other services. That being said, the law school itself provides a lot of educational experiences by which people interact socially. So we have um, and a variety of different types of clubs and groups that you should think about joining. There are things like a trial advocacy, moot court and the advocacy institute in which you would get involved in moot court mock trial. They have a variety of events, travel teams around the country. 
um, and they have social events as part of that. There's also the journals like Law Review um, and others. They have a banquet every year. Um, there are and really an uncountable number of guest lectures with uh, pizza and variety of other beverages throughout the course of the year. And all of the different student groups, affinity groups, um, you know, run a huge gamut of interests, which include, you know, a business law interest if you're interested in it. Um, so you can bring in speakers and other ways in which to socialize with each other. All right, thank you. Yes, you will. I, I can say for sure you will not lack for opportunity to socialize with each other. That's good to hear. Yeah. And Brian, as a 1L, you can actually join the student ambassador group if you are interested. That's one way to meet other students who like to help out with some of our admissions events and something that doesn't require a whole lot of effort as a first year when we really want you to focus on academics. Um, and you'll if you end up at Buffalo, which of course we hope you do, you'll learn about our student ambassador program as early as orientation. Okay, great, thank you. And Michael, I did wanna point out that I shared Professor Dimmick's uh, profile information in the chat box. Oh, thank you very much. I was actually on the website right now writing his contact information down, but I really oh, appreciate great. it, thank you. And we have a question in the chat box. How do one else spend their Fridays if classes are Monday through Thursday? Um, see, that's a trick question to ask for the dean while she's being recorded. Um, obviously, studying the entire time. Um, so, no. Um, there are a variety of different types of things that students do on their Fridays. Um, they could be engaged in pro bono activities um, and various other types of volunteer work to, to or observing court. Um, you know, there is, in fact, studying, which is a, a highly recommended activity. Um, on most days, um, and I think there's a lot of other things. Maybe, Lindsay, you can answer that better. Sure, I would say that my guess is our 1Ls are using that time to read or catch up on work or get ahead of work for the following week, and I believe this Friday, if I'm not mistaken, is our virtual student panel, so if you are able to join, you can hear directly from our students about how they're spending their Fridays. Upper level students might actually have class on Fridays, but if not, it's a full day where they could be pursuing um, an externship, which is actually a class for academic credit. Or if they have a part-time legal job, they could be spending that day you know, working. Um, but Friday is a really great day to you know, catch up on your schoolwork or get ahead for the following weeks. But I would say it's definitely a mixed bag. We would like to hope that all of our first years are using the full day to, to study and to read. You actually do have a lot of revising that you need to do. So the way it works when you're a first year student, especially with the casebook method, is that you have all of these different cases and readings that you need to do in your first year courses. And they're very intense. And you'll be going back and forth in class in order to pull out distinctions of law and writing a lot of notes. But in order to process those, you need to have time in which to review and revise those notes and then compare them to some other things. It would be a really good day to form a study group to meet. I highly recommend one. I have one and there's a noticeable difference in success between students who have a study group and students who don't. It's infinitely easier to learn something by teaching it to someone else than it is to learn it on your own. And also just because something makes sense in your own mind, when you have to articulate it to somebody else or they challenge you on your understanding of it, it becomes more apparent to where gaps in your knowledge were before. So Fridays would be a great way to maybe meet your study group for lunch or something like that and revise. Okay, we have another question in the chat box. How early do you recommend getting involved in pro bono work? So there are, um, when, you, when you come in, you'll talk with the pro bono office and Lindsay can go into more detail on when we, because we do want you to focus on your study and there's limits to the amount of pro bono hours you can do in your first year. But I would say really as soon as possible. Um, there is a magical change that comes over a law student where after time they've been working for a client or they've been observing a case or they've been assisting somebody else. And for those, when they do journals, for example, for the first four or five weeks, they'll say something like, I did this and I did that and I did that. But then this transformation happens when you really bond with the client and their issues and what turns from an I to a we, 
we argued, we challenged, we filed, right? And, and that is really when you're becoming a lawyer because there is no I, you know, in the concept of being an attorney, you're an advocate, you're a representative, regardless of whether or not it's litigation or transactional work, it's work on the behalf of somebody else. It's their legal issues you're representing, not your own, <laughs> right? Uh, you are doing it for your own purposes. You're representing someone else in their time of need. You are crafting with them a strategy and attempting to achieve a result um, on behalf of your clients. So the sooner and it, through any form of work, but of course, pro bono for the public good is, um, you know, is, is laudable, right? Make sure that you work on different types of cases so that you begin that process of identifying as attorney, right? As advisor. Um, and um, so the sooner the better. I think we have another question in the chat. Um, can you speak to opportunities for students wanting to focus in immigration law? Sure. We have courses on immigration law, externships on immigration law. Um, we have bridge classes on immigration law, different alumni work in immigration law. So uh, immigration is a subset of administrative law. So it's a, it's a good idea to get a strong founding in your first year of course. So, so basically for all of you, it's really important to get a comprehensive strong founding in all of the first year mandatory courses. The curriculums are identical in the first year in all law schools for a reason, because they are the mandatory building blocks of what we call legal fluency. And you need to master those skill sets in all of those classes in order to advance into more specialized areas of law that grow out of the, the uh, five main areas of doctrinal law that we study in the first year. So immigration law is a subset of what we call administrative law. So you need to understand how the administrative law the agencies work in the first place before you can really understand how to specialize in the law of immigration um, and the agencies which govern immigration law in our country. Um, so, so, you know, so it takes a little bit of a path in order to get the skills from one to the other. Then once outside of coursework and classwork, it's always recommended to think about doing an externship or some kind of experiential learning program um, with people. We have strong relationships with many, many, many different um, immigration uh, agencies and places like Journey's End. Thank you. So the next question in the chat box is what career planning resources do you offer and when are they available to students? So um, again, Lindsay, when do when do they meet with the one else for the first time? In their first semester? Well, actually during orientation week. Right. So career services will meet with you during we have career services office. Uh, career services will meet with you during orientation week and they're available right from the beginning and then they have a kind of a former required meeting where you start speaking with them. It's important when also thinking about jobs and it's good to think about them early that you want to approach this from a place also of flexibility. You want to think to your you're going to learn a lot about who you are as an attorney and what areas of law both interest you and don't interest you over time. So um, it's the kind of thing where you really want to figure out and expose yourself to good, solid experiences earlier. So something in the first year summer is obviously very important. You know, then there's things like on-campus recruiting, which will lead to a second year uh, job, a second year summer job, and various other ways in which you can get into a second year summer job. The second year summer is the job that traditionally they make you an offer for when you graduate. So it's very possible that your entire career search can be wrapped up by the end of your second year summer. Um, but there's also different ways, and um, that's for a lot of private law firms, but there's also government jobs and a variety of different ways in the law that's, uh, and job application paths. So I recommend definitely going to speak with them as early as you like. I should also note that our career services staff will be hosting a virtual session tomorrow from four to five. So they'll go into quite a bit of detail about all the services they offer. And they'll also um, open the floor to questions and they'll have you know, a lot more detail to share with you. So if you are available tomorrow at four, you can join us. You should have received the links to all the events um, last week. If you are not available, the recording will be up on our website probably by, hopefully by the end of next week, as soon as possible. We'll also do what's called a mentor match for you. You get assigned an alumni mentor in your first year. 
um, and they're selected by whatever interest you say you're currently interested in, um, and they, they will help you. But I also recommend this is a good reason to go out into events that we host with the community, um, those educational experiential events that I was talking about. It's a good way for you to come to the attention of alumni and meet them, and they also can be very good guides and helpers for you while you um, work on your career path. We have another question. How are older students, perhaps with families, supported during the 1L year to accommodate a balance of school and social life? So every student's experience is difficult, is different and difficult in different ways. And we have the Office of Student Life and Student Services that, um, and you'll meet with, when is, when is that session? When did they meet with Bernadette Gargano? She does not have her own session this week. Mm -hmm but she is available. Uh... Well, you'll certainly meet her during orientation. So, Absolutely. <laughs> so we have an office with vice dean of students whose, whose purpose is to try to support and ease you in a variety of different circumstances. Um, so what I would recommend is that you meet with Student Life or send them an email um, so that you can see what possible supports and enrichment are available for your particular situation ahead of time and so that we can engage those resources to your benefit as early as possible. I'm looking to see if any hands are up. I will go to one of my prepared questions. Um, here we are. Oh, I got a hand up. Oh, excellent, Jim. Hi, um, just building off the last question, I'm just wondering as someone who has children, um, like I am gonna be there in the fall and I'm nervous about the uh, how demanding it will be of my time. And I'm wondering, uh, you know, uh, with respect to the first year and going forward, well, with respect to the first year, how many hours would you say the average student spends uh, between studying and class time? And then going forward, will I be able to um, uh, have a more flexible schedule where maybe I don't have to be there every day of the week? Sure. Um, so you can absolutely do this. I remember when my mom went to law school, I was a child and I remember when she was attending law school and she had four kids, um, one of them was me. Um, and, and, I, and I'm okay, you know, um, there's a, it is a, it, it is a challenge because there is a lot of time involved. And in general, we recommend setting about three hours um, for every hour of class time. So you can do the math on that. Um, but the majority of it does not have, you do not have to study in school. Um, you know, it's, it can be done at, at home. Although again, I would recommend um, to really think about finding a good group of fellow students um, that can be part of your study group and arrange different ways to keep keep each other on track. Um, and then as a second and a third year, yes, you pick your own classes based on your schedule and your interests. There are, of course, other required courses that you have to work into that, um, but, but there's options so that you can be uh, flexible. Great, we have two more questions in the chat box. First is what opportunities are there to work on or off campus during school? So you are not supposed to work during your first year. Uh, Lindsay, maybe you wanna go over that with them? Sure, yes. So we, it's not a hard and fast rule, but you will hear from everyone who works in our student support area that you should really avoid working in the first year um, if possible, because we really want you to get through the first year successfully and be with us for, for your 2L year. Um, so we do recommend that if you can avoid it, not working in the first year. In the summer following your first year and then your 2L and your 3L year, there are opportunities to work on campus. Um, the university has something, uh, I guess, a hiring platform called Bullseye. Uh, I know within the School of Law, various offices hire law students as well um, for part-time positions. Um, for example, in the Office of Admissions, we usually hire a law student to help us out with some administrative work. Um, career services might be looking for student workers as well. Um, but there are other opportunities across campus, and that's why we certainly recommend that you look at um, the Bullseye website. 
And then off campus, our career services office, and again, you'll hear from them tomorrow afternoon, they would be very helpful in helping you find perhaps legal positions off campus, more so over the summer, but it's it's possible that something will come across their desk that's during the academic year as well. Um, but for on campus, we the, the university has a website and we certainly recommend students look at that um, after their 1L year. Another thing to think about to impress your 1L faculty is um, we all hire research assistants. Um, so that's a paid position where you work directly for a professor um, on, and assist in their research and scholarship. And it's a great opportunity to, I, I, you get very, I get very close with my research assistants, um, help them in their careers. It's a great opportunity um, you know, in, in, to, to work and really bond with the faculty person and delve deep into a different area of scholarship. Great, our next question is from Katie. Are there any resources for out-of-state students to help find off-campus housing and navigating Buffalo for the first time? Yes, in fact, our admissions coordinator, Rachel's who, Rachel, who is on with us today, she recently recorded a Buffalo 101 video, and I believe my colleague Laurel just posted the link to that. Um, so we recommend starting there, but we also welcome you to schedule an appointment with us. That could be by Zoom or phone if you're not able to travel in town from, or to town for an appointment. And we can walk you through um, kind of the process or the, I guess, recommendations regarding finding off-campus housing. We are, I believe everyone in the admissions office is from the Western New York area and well versed in you know the different neighborhoods that you might want to look into um, and we can answer all questions about buffalo and the university i would start with the buffalo 101 video and then you could also visit our um, admissions web page to find the visit us link to schedule a one-on-one -on -one appointment with anyone in the admissions office and we can help you Please let me know if you have any follow-up questions to, to the housing question. As you can see, Vicing Gladney runs a very smooth operation. So, um, you know, feel free to send any questions that come to you over the course of this week, any kind of, of these, and we will direct you to the right person where you can get additional specific resources. Okay, what is the orientation process like? <laughs> um, what is the orientation process like? That's an interesting metaphysical question. Um, so we can go over the specifics of it. You know, we have um, um, a week of events, basically. You start, here's the link to, um, you know, oh, that's a different link. Laurel, maybe we'll also put up orientation schedule. But um, basically we have a week of, of events and you'll have already started in your legal writing class. So there'll be you know, an opportunity to bond with your sections there. We, I do another introduction for you to make you feel properly welcome and supported in the UB law culture. Um, there are a variety of both educational and social events and um, hopefully you will be able to retain some of it so that we start you off properly. Uh, the schedule isn't available yet. Orientation, however, will take place between the 22nd and the 26th, and it's very similar year for year. So I'll tell you that we have a lot of different um, instructional sessions over the course of the week to help prepare you. And you set up for your computers, which these days is very, very important. And I'll just add that orientation is mandatory. Um, we also offer a pre-orientation program called Jumpstart. Some students are admitted and required to attend Jumpstart as a condition of their admission, but it is an option for everyone and you will likely receive an email in early June offering you the option to opt into Jumpstart if you are not required to attend. Um, one other thing, and I apologize if the Dean already mentioned this, but your legal analysis writing and research course begins during orientation. So it typically begins on the second day of orientation. So while orientation is mandatory for, for other reasons, it's especially mandatory because your classes begin during orientation. So please keep that in mind. Yes, and I would recommend to you and your friends, if you want to get a jump start, feel free to sign up and start jump start 
in the summer. Um, it does make the transition much less anxious because you'll have had the opportunity to learn a variety of different skills over a longer period of time, get used to the facilities and kind of the language of the law um, that'll help prepare you for your, uh, your, your first year. I'm gonna tell you this at orientation, but I'll say it again now. One of the best investments you can get is to get a law dictionary. Um, a lot of the things that are difficult here is the way that the words sound don't sound like they mean. Um, and it's really important to look up every one of those words um, so that you know their proper legal meaning. Um, and that will help you a great, a really good long way to prepare for um, being able to understand what you're learning in the class. Uh, the learning curve as a 1L is extremely high. Uh, the social scientists have proven it's one of the greatest warp speed acquisitions of knowledge available in higher education. You will learn an enormous amount um, in a very, very short period of time. We can guarantee that. Um, law school is hard and no one's gonna tell you that it isn't because it is. Um, and there's, but that's okay, you can do it. Or again, we wouldn't have admitted you to the school. And we're prepared to help you have the opportunity so there's no interest in hiding the ball from the techniques that will help you succeed. Um, you know, how to read a case, how to brief it, how to prepare to discuss it, how to argue, how to remember to argue the opposite of what you're arguing. You know, make sure you keep in mind all the different options, keep things open, you know, um, learn the rhetoric of the law, learn its language but never also learn sight that will lose sight of the fact that while those are all skills that make you an effective advocate, right? What we want is to also make sure that you understand that you're always representing people, people and companies and corporations and other types of entities that need you, that are going to be hiring you, that you have an ethical responsibility to consistently do your best for. Um, and so marrying those two things together the skills and the passion for the law is what we do here at UB Law. And you will do it. You can do it. You can. I just want to mention that Jumpstart is a three week program that begins the first Monday, I'm sorry, the second Monday in August um, for domestic students. And it is completely free of charge. Um, so Definitely when you see that email, I would strongly consider participating if your summer schedule allows you to. And again, if you're not already required to do so, because it's uh, two weeks, I believe, for domestic students, completely free of charge. It's um, run by our director for student academic success, Professor uh, Bill McDonald. Um, can't recommend it enough. And we, over the last two summers, when we've invited all of our incoming students to participate, I think we've had between one third and one half of our entire entering 1L class participate in the program. And we've received very positive feedback. So I cannot stress that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer a question you didn't ask, right? So the, the study of the law is a spiral, right? It's really important to understand that. You're going to be reprising the same areas of law over and over again through your entire career, just at a higher level of understanding. That's why it's so important to master your skills in that for in those first year classes contracts you're going at contracts again higher level contracts is every kind of contract employment contract you know um, sales contracts all the different types of contracts in the world telecommunication every single one of them has its own nuance but also they have to, you have to re, you have to get to them at a higher level of understanding it's like training for a sport you can't do the um, the uh, you, you can't do the things you need to do without training. Um, and you wanna make sure you train correctly so you don't injure yourself, right? Um, it's very important to consistently just do the work and master each level. And that's gonna be hard because there's gonna be areas of study that maybe you just don't find as inherently interesting. I mean, obviously as Dean, I will say formally that all areas of the law are inherently interesting, but it is also true that sometimes Maybe, for example, property isn't something that you initially, you know, think is as fascinating, um, although it is. But you want to make sure that you don't skip over that because you're going to find later in your in your education that you'll have needed to understand those principles of property law in order to understand a more advanced theory of law that's going to be coming your way later. 
Um, that's why law takes three years and the first year is only the beginning. Um, so the, the specifics of when to do things are less really important than the mindset of making sure you continue to do things seeking mastery, right? And don't get discouraged because these are hard concepts to gain, um, but you, you can do it. And it's important to continuously come back to them so that you can understand the principles and the doctrines that, are, that you're working with in criminal law, constitutional law, uh, torts, and all those different types of things. Does that make some sense to you guys? And if you keep doing that, you'll become a really good lawyer. There is no other trick to it. I mean, I will tell you, yes, turn your uh, assignments in on time. That does help. You know, following deadlines and things like that. Of course that helps, you know? Um, but there is no secret trick to it other than the work and studying law. Okay, someone asked if there will be a, a deadline to sign up for Jumpstart, and yes, that deadline is to be determined, but you're going to look for a communication in June about opting into the program again if you're not required to participate, and there will be a deadline outlined in that communication. Um, so that information is, is forthcoming. We missed a question a little earlier that I'm going to go back to. When do we find out our class schedules, and do we have any control over our schedules for 1L year? So our records and registration office will begin enrolling students in the, their sections, usually around the end of July or beginning of August. Only if you have submitted your final degree noted transcript and you have met all the university's immunization requirements and all other holds have been removed from your account. Um, I have to mention all of those uh, requirements because we will run into issues later on this summer and um, you will not be registered if you don't have those things on file. Um, but later this afternoon, actually this evening, I'll be running a session called You've Been Admitted, Now What? And I'll cover everything that you have to do post-admission to make sure you're ready um, to begin your 1L year in August. Um, and then do we get any control over our schedules? Unfortunately, no. Our registrar will blindly enroll students into one of two sections. And each of those sections have sub writing sections that are smaller. Um, so unfortunately, uh, we cannot take requests because then we would be fielding requests from um, 150 different incoming 1Ls. I don't know if the Dean wants to add anything to that. There's, all sections are good, so don't worry about it. Um, the, you know, um, hopefully you'll form some slight rivalry between the U and B section, that's always healthy. Um, and you probably will make better friends with people in your section, but you can make a, a determined effort to also meet, meet people in the other section because uh, you'll be spending a lot of time in the same classes with ones in your section. Um, but you know the, that's the only distinction um, really between either section. Um, and then of course, once you're a 2L, you go back into being altogether. Okay, great. Next question is, where do alumni work if they're not interested in litigation? Oh, a million places. Um, so there are a variety of different types of non-litigation law jobs um, that are very interesting. So there's, for example, real estate, you know, real estate transactions and just the whole real estate industry, commercial and pers private, pers individual. Um, there are companies, so you could work for a bank in compliance um, or a bank in a variety of other issues, you know, um, but that's a very traditional work path. Um, there's education and government. A lot of people go into government jobs that aren't litigation per se. I mean, the government hires a lot of lawyers, too, who work for the government, but there's a lot of positions in government, uh, legislative or other types of areas of law um, that aren't litigation in any way, um, but they are certainly something you should think about working, could think about working for an administrative agency, um, federal, state, or local. Um, I'm trying to think, there are a lot of, there, there's, a, there's a ton of different non-litigation things, and that's just, that are non, um, and then there are, transac there's transactional law, like uh, Brian asked about before. The business law of business, um, which is the type you'd still work for a firm, 
but would be doing, wouldn't be in a courthouse. He'd be creating deals or negotiating um, different types of, of, of transactions on behalf of your clients that they need legal advice for, or securities work or things like that, like stocks. Um, so there's that whole area of private law. And then of course there's working as a general counsel. So pretty much every company or institution has a counsel's office where they give advice to uh, um, the, count, the company, but they also hire the litigators who would then represent them. That's called outside counsel. Um, so you could be inside counsel or outside counsel. You could be in a private firm in litigation or transaction. You could work in a totally non-firm environment for government or for industry in a variety of different ways. Um, and pretty much anything you could think of needs lawyers. Now, obviously I believe that lawyers solve all problems. You might get an argument from other fields, but I truly believe that that is the best way for us to uh, solve problems is to have really good, well-trained lawyers to advise. Oh, and hospitals, I forgot. Yeah, there's the entire healthcare industry, pretty much every industry. You're muted, Lindsay. I apologize. Can you speak okay. a little bit about student research opportunities? Okay, yes, of course, there's a ton of those. And so you can be hired as a research assistant and work directly for a faculty on their research. Or for your own research, we have a variety of seminars, different types of paper classes where you could do um, research on interesting field, interesting topics of your own. You could obviously take an independent study if any of if the seminars don't suit what you need. So you would have a professor supervise your research. Um, there are so many opportunities. There's, a, there's um, different journals by which you would do research, you would edit, and then um, you could write an article for publication in the journal. You could do a paper for a seminar, an independent study, and seek to get that published outside of um, in a different journal at a different school. So I, I would say the opportunities for student research are also really endless. It's just a question of your endurance. Okay, we have one more question in the chat. Do alumni end up going into academia? Of course, yes. My father um, was a UB law grad. Um, he graduated in the class of 1970. Um, he, a, he was a professor of law for, I'm gonna call it 30 years, like ish. Um, at Fordham uh, Law School in New York City, and um, um, and obviously proud UB Law family. This is also where he met my mother. She was a BFA at the time, and then, as the story I said at the beginning, she later went to law school downstate with us. Um, so he's a good example, um, and you know, different. There's different academic paths um, for 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 graduates. Uh, it's a long-term goal. It's kind of like saying, do, do UB Law graduates become judges? Yes, they do. Um, but there's intermittent steps usually. Hey, I don't see any additional questions in the chat at this time. So I will ask a question unless we have anyone who would like to speak on camera or raise their hand. We do have about 10 more minutes, so I'm going to ask a question before it gets too late, but what advice, Dean Abramovsky, do you have for incoming law students? My advice, and this is going to be really hard, right? This is the hardest advice, and it's different this year than probably give any kind of year, but try to trust in the process, right? Uh, anxiety is the, um, it's kind of the watchword for all of us after the last couple of years. And that is totally and completely natural. Um, what I will say is that law schools have done this for a long time. And this law school, as I told you, is my family school. We really do have your interest in development at the per as the core purpose for why we do when we do it. That's not to say don't be self-motivated, right? That's not to say don't look for opportunities, don't follow up you know, with, with things, make, don't make sure you go to career, so you want to make sure you do all of the things, right? Go to career services, meet with the alumni, join the clubs, all of those things, right? But if there's any advice I would tell you for this incoming year is trust the process. You will turn out exceptional attorneys if you do the work. Okay, we still have 
nine minutes. So I will just wait a moment to see if anyone else raises their hand or poses a question in the chat. Is this helpful a little bit? Okay, good. I guess we can end with Dean Abramovsky. What? Oh, oh, I got it. We got another question late coming in the chat. Let's see what that is. We do. As a first year, should we be focusing on other aspects of career development or legal development other than studying and GPA? Oh, okay. So that's a so. So it's learning, right? It's not just your GPA, <laughs> right? It's about mastering the material is the first thing to really understand. It isn't just about getting an A or a B. It's about actually knowing how the law works and then being able to articulate it. The grade is a reflection of your capacity to articulate what you've learned in a, and then be assessed on. But what you need to really make sure you do is learn it, right? And master it. So that's your first job, is mastery of the law. Um, so, which does involve studying, but it's not the only thing it involves, okay? Um, for your careers, I would say, and also for your social uh, health, right, is to make friends. Nothing is more useful to a lawyer's career than friends, um, because friends lead to these things called clients, um, which is, at the end of the day, what it is we do. Um, so, it's important to make friends with your colleagues. It's helpful to make friends out in the community with the alumni, you know, um, you know, who the alumni just means that they're lawyers who've graduated from here, you know, who, uh, who might want to work with you on different types of things or products or just speak with you about different things, help guide you. You'll see part of the whole purpose of legal education is it is our moral responsibility as a profession. What distinguishes this from any other job being a lawyer is this is one of the great professions. And it's our moral responsibility as attorneys to train the next generation of attorneys. That is what we do as a professional, as a profession, right? To make sure that there are ethical, trained advocates available to serve society's needs and maintain the rule of law. So there are many, many people who might be interested in speaking with you. So I would say make friends would be my other advice to what to do as a one off. Great, so I think we can close with one final question that I'm going to pose is why should everyone who's joined us today and who will continue to consider UB School of Law attend Buffalo this fall? Well, I have to tell you, and I say this every year, you guys seem to be an incredible group of people, you know, interested and sharp. This is a great year to go to law school. So I think the fall is going to be um, really good, positive experience. And um, UB is New York State's public law school, my family's school. I don't think there's a better choice. Thank you so much, Dean Abramovsky. Um, I wanted to give a special shout out to the Dean for taking time today to join us and to answer all of your questions. Um, we know how extremely busy your schedule is. So, so thank you, thank you, thank you. And to everyone who's joined us this afternoon, we hope to see you either later today at five o'clock for the next session or throughout the week. And again, we encourage you to schedule those on-campus visits for the month of April. Um, so thank you again for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day and have a great week. Thank you guys. Pleasure to meet you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.